Proverbs chapter 6, verses 6 through 11. Go to the ant, O sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief, officer, or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest. How long will you lie there, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber, and want like an armed man. The word of the Lord. Or perhaps you're familiar with the, uh, the great Disney movie animated picture called Wally. If you've seen it, Wally is a uh, sort of a futuristic, sort of cute story about a, a curious robot whose job it is to clean up earth that has been trashed. While humans once inhabited the earth, according to this story, we, we soon discover that by the 29th century, that things have gotten so bad because of pollution that all the humans were evacuated off of the earth to a space station. And so the robot Wally eventually finds his way to the space station where the, the humans have gone. And in the story, they're, they're living supposedly a utopian, sort of carefree, work-free experience in the space station. They're waited on hand and foot by robots attending to their every whim and desire. And so as a result, uh, in the animated picture, sort of the, the, the pampered humans have become self-indulgent, sort of bored couch potatoes. With the, the passage of time on the space station, the, the, the humans, even adult humans, they, they start to resemble giant babies with, with big heads and, and, and little bodies and rounded torsos and stubby, sort of weak limbs the result of doing nothing but cruising around on cushy padded chairs for their whole existence, simply staring at video screens, taking in lots and lots of calories, sipping from straws, sticking out of giant cups in their chairs. The creators of Wally explore many interesting themes in the movie, but, but a huge theme in this movie is what it means to be human. As human beings, we're not created to be do-nothings. God made us to find joy and to worship him in our efforts, in our work. Well, this morning we're continuing and concluding our sermon series in the book of Proverbs, and, and we're comparing some of the, the, the New Year's wisdom of the world, and we're, we're holding it up against the, the wisdom from God's Word in the book of Proverbs. So our title this morning is this phrase called Rise and Grind. Maybe you've heard this before. It comes from sort of an alteration of the phrase rise and shine. The meaning is, is get up and work, get going. The, the earlier you can work, the better. The more productive you can be, the better. And yet our relationship with work can be complicated, isn't it? We can work sometimes too hard. Other times, like our passage this morning, working not enough. You know, Proverbs chapter 6, our passage I read, gives us some, some practical wisdom for us in dealing with our relationship with work. This chapter provides wisdom on, on, on various topics. If you, you kind of read all of chapter 6, there's, there's various topics that are addressed. Everything from relationships and towards the end about, about unity. Even money is addressed as well. But in each of them, in the topics here in chapter 6, the, the theme is, is that there are negative examples. Negative examples that point us to positive wisdom. Negative examples that teach us the positive wisdom from the Lord. This so is the main idea of at least verses 6 through 11. These six verses here in Proverbs 6 is simply this, that we were created to work diligently for the glory of God. That you were created to work diligently for the glory of God. And I want to start this morning actually at the end of the passage and then come back to the, the beginning of the passage. 
So I first want us to consider the warning of this passage. We said there's sort of a negative example that leads to sort of positive wisdom. But the warning is simply this. Don't be a sluggard. Don't be a sluggard. We see that there in verse 6. It it says, O sluggard. It's addressing someone as a sluggard. And then verse 9, How long would you lie there, O sluggard? Perhaps you've heard of the the seven deadly sins. They're not exactly biblical. Uh, They really draw from from church tradition. Uh, But you have pride and envy and gluttony and lust and anger and greed. But the last of these seven deadly sins, traditionally, is something called sloth or laziness. Now, out of all of those differences, I mean, you know, I was talking about gluttony and envy and lust, pride, anger, greed. You might think, well, sloth, laziness, that doesn't seem so bad. It doesn't seem that deadly for a deadly sin. And perhaps you imagine, well, look, we're, we're here in Boston, right? And, and Bostonians are probably some of the most hyperactive, hyperproductive people on the planet, we, we, we literally run on Duncan. Isn't that what it says? We're Starbucks. Americans generally are known for working longer hours, taking fewer vacations than most of the rest of the world. So sloth seems to be the least sort of deadly sin, maybe the least relevant of these to us. And yet the truth is, if we're honest, we read this passage, verses 6 through 11, We all have some sluggard in us. We all procrastinate sometimes. We all daydream. We sometimes run late to appointments or even miss them entirely. I know some of us, perhaps, fritter away even whole evenings or hours on TV or scrolling and swiping Facebook or YouTube, Instagram, whatever social media addiction you might have at the moment. If we're honest, there there are a lot of things that we plan to do, that we want to do, that we know we should do, but we don't follow through on. We often end up neglecting even the Lord, other people, relationships, because of our sloth, our laziness, or our distraction. And so our passage, as I said, addresses the sluggard. It's a warning against being a sluggard. I guess we should define that. What what is a sluggard? A sluggard, as my mother-in-law used to say, it's like uh, molasses in January. It's being slow and hesitant when instead we should be decisive and active and forthright. Scripture actually talks a lot about this idea of being a sluggard. The book of Proverbs, it's a common theme. There's many Proverbs that are addressed to sluggards, those who are lazy. Proverbs 26 says, As as a door turns on its hinges, so does a sluggard on his bed. He's lazy, passive, constantly making the, the soft choice, losing one opportunity after another, after another, day by day, moment by moment. And we can all see and admit that there are elements of sluggardness in each of us. As I said, the sluggard appears throughout the book of Proverbs. We see here first in our passage that the sluggard does not take action and then justifies his inactivity. Look at me at verses 9 and 10. Verse 9 says, How long will you lie there, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? There's the inactivity, the inaction. And then the justification in verse 10. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. You see that question in verse 9, how long will you lie there? When will you arise? There is no answer. There is no plan. There is no intentionality. There is no motivation. Only excuses. I just need a little more sleep. I know no one here has probably any idea about this, but I've heard that there are folks who will hit their snooze button on their alarm over and over and over again. 
Actually, I saw a quote from someone online who said that, that I, uh, I set two alarms in the morning. My first alarm is the person I want to be, and the second alarm is the person who I really am. There's an old story from a Los Angeles Times from a while ago. It was a man who went back, actually, to the house where he grew up. He hadn't lived there for, for 20 years, but... He spoke to the current owners and asked if he could look around in the attic. In fact, they hadn't cleaned out the attic. And so when he went up there, he actually found an old jacket that he used to own. And he reached into the pocket of this jacket and he pulled out a little ticket. It was a little receipt, a pay stub for a, a shoe repair shop. It turns out that, that this man realized that he had taken a, a pair of shoes to the repair shop 20 years before and he had never picked them up. And so in the midst of moving, he kind of forgotten all about it. And so now he says, well, just as a joke, I'm going to go show up to this shoe repair shop and bring my little receipt. So he goes, he shows up to the man behind the desk, and he says, are my shoes ready after 20 years? And the guy looks at the receipt. He goes back to the back of the room. He comes back to the counter, and he says, come back a week from Thursday, and your shoes will be ready. That's the mind of a sluggard. We're always saying, come back. I'll get to it. A week from Thursday, even after 20 years. You know, in our lives, we rarely say never. We're planning or making goals, things we need to do. We, we say a week from Thursday. We justify it like verse 10 does. I know I have to take care of my diet, my body. I want to be healthier, but maybe I'll start next week or I'll, I'll wait till I'm older until the doctor at my physical says, all right, come on, you need to start eating better. I know I need to get our, my finances in shape and make a budget and watch over my spending. I, I know I should be giving more to the church and being more generous with those in need around me. But I'll, I'll do that next year. I just need to wait so I can get this job or get this next job or get the, the pay raise a little bit more. Then I'll get my finances in better order. I know I shouldn't just attend church. I should join as, as a member or at least serve more in the church or get involved in a group. But, but maybe next semester, probably next semester, we'll calm down. We'll be a little less busy. Next semester is never less busy, at least from my experience. <laughs> Maybe your husband here this morning. I know I really should be initiating devotions with my wife. I know I, I wanted to do that. We should be praying together and doing this. And, but, you know, maybe, maybe when we're older and things calm down, we, I, I'll, I'll get to the place or we'll do that. Even for all of us, just I know as a believer, I should be devoted to prayer. I don't pray enough. But maybe, maybe, I don't know, things will slow down eventually and I'll, I'll make more time for that. Let me just get through this season. Maybe when I'm older, when I'm retired, I can take time to pray. Friends, Proverbs chapter 6 is a wake-up call for the sluggardly nature in us. For the excuses that we make. The danger is not to say never, but a week from Thursday. We give ourselves permission to avoid doing what we know we should, what God is calling us to do today. And the God's Word says that sluggards actually deceive themselves. Proverbs 26 says this, Sluggards are wiser in their own eyes than seven people who answer discreetly. In the ancient world, seven was like a number of completion. So, but imagine, seven people, the advice of seven people, no, no, I'm going to take my own advice, have my own view of myself. There's a blindness yourself there. And finally, if the sluggard is, is able eventually to get going, to find some motivation, God's word says it doesn't last. There isn't the perseverance, the determination, the, the grit. God's word says the sluggard buries his hand in the dish and it wears him out even to bring it back to his mouth. He does not stick with a task all the way through to a strong finish, but perhaps like a New Year's resolution that doesn't last. 
But friends, there is a life. God's word makes clear there is a, there's a life, there's a job, there's a mission, a God-glorifying purpose out there for each and every one of us. And it is ungodly to fall into laziness, to live as a, a sluggard who prefers to roll over in his bed. And what is the result of this in verse 11? It's poverty that the sluggard is surprised by. It comes upon them like a robber, like an armed man. Of course, the poverty is financial here, but I think it could even be broader. A spiritual poverty, an emotional, relational poverty without living intentional life. And so friends, I think that's enough bad news for us this morning. <laughs> that's heavy. This is the warning of this passage, right, in verses 9 to 11. I want to be honest about that. But there is good news here for us. What is the wisdom? What does God point us to in his wisdom? Well, the wisdom is in verses 6 through 8, that we should work diligently for God's glory. So what's the prognosis, or I guess what's the treatment for the disease of being a sluggard? Look at me at verse 6. Go to the ant. You notice the, uh, the, the treatment, the solution is not to find a life coach. It's not to read a, a self-help book. But it's simply to use our eyes, observe, and observe one of the smallest creatures that we encounter. Go to the ant and take notes. An ant. Quite humiliating for homo sapiens like us to learn from an ant. You know, I'm sure that a, a sluggard wouldn't mind learning from an expert in their field or, or a mentor or a, a godly writer in their spiritual life, maybe like C.S. Lewis or, or Tim Keller or John Calvin, one of these great theologians. But wisdom tells us instead to, to look at the ant. One pastor says this, he says, I don't know anyone with a PhD in antology, Instead, most of us want to study bigger, more important things. But God sends us to ant school. And so what do we learn in verses 6 through 8 from the ant? The first thing we learn is inner motivation. Look at verse 7. Verse 7 says, Without having any chief or officer or ruler... There is no boss ant standing over the ant with a, a whip. Ants are, are self-organizing insects. They, they don't report to anyone. I mean, of course, every ant colony has a queen, but, but the queen primarily just lays eggs and doesn't usually take time to issue orders to the entire colony. An ant has within herself all of the, the motivation she needs to make something of her life. And she keeps going. She doesn't give up. This motivation. But of course, this is where we need to be careful, right? Because there are a lot of diligent workers out there who are motivated by the wrong things. Of course, we can tend in a desire not to be a sluggard in underwork. We can tend instead to, to overwork. And in fact, most sermons that I've ever preached about work are about overwork. I mean, I was, when I was preparing for this sermon series and looking at God's word, Proverbs has a lot to say about underwork. Yet yeah, we need to be careful of both things. That we are not motivated by the wrong reasons that cause us to work too much. Here's another proverb to balance out. Proverbs 6, we have Proverbs 23. Do not toil to acquire wealth. Be discerning enough to desist. When your eyes light on it, it is gone. That is, your wealth is gone. For suddenly it sprouts wings, flying like an eagle toward heaven. It's funny how much security we think we can have in money. And yet it's one stock market crash, one medical diagnosis, at least in this country, or of course one death 
which causes all of our wealth to vanish. No, instead, God's word calls us, yes, to work faithfully, not to be lazy, but to do so not out of a selfish motivation. Not out of a selfish motivation. How do you know if you're, if you're working out of a selfish motivation? Well, some questions you might ask is, are you working too much? Are you overworking? Are you putting your, your work and your efforts before your relationship with God and with others? For a lot of us, we want to be a good witness at work. We want to work a lot, but perhaps you could be a better witness if you actually took Sundays off and said, sir, I don't answer emails there. Or if, or if you took time away on an evening to join a community group or set boundaries and say, no, this work is not the most important thing in my life. God's word in the New Testament calls us to work faithfully, but with a different motivation. Ephesians 4 says that we should do honest work so that we might have something to share with others in need. Not for our own security, but to share with others. Paul says the same thing in 2 Thessalonians 3. He rebukes those who are idle, and he says that they should work so they should, wouldn't be a burden to other believers around them. And of course, we have the early church in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4 as they're, they're gathering together and they're selling their possessions and giving to all who have need. Of course, ultimately, Colossians 3 tells us our motivation, that whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward, you are serving the Lord Christ. You know, I don't know about you, but it's very easy to fall into either overwork or underwork. And perhaps for some of you, you kind of pendulum swing between the two, you kind of overcompensate. Friends, how can we avoid not overworking, putting our identity in our work, while at the same time not being lazy, not simply living for ourselves and our own ambition? I think the only solution is Christ. In, in the gospel, the fact that, that God has sent his one and only son to die for sinners like us, that we know that we don't have to work and earn his approval, but that we can rest in it, know that, that God loves us no matter what we do, no matter how much we accomplish, no matter how many degrees or, or GPA or money in our checking account or, or papers published, that we are smiled upon and called approved because of the forgiveness that Jesus offers. And yet at the same time, Jesus doesn't just beam us right up to heaven immediately. We are left here on the earth not to wander aimlessly waiting for heaven, but to be used by God. We have much work to do, but not motivated to prove our existence, but in response to God's work in us and his desire to use us and work through us. Friends, that is where the motivation lies. And so friends, we can be like the ant Motivated not by a boss, not by our own ambition, but ultimately by serving and glorifying the Lord Jesus. Not from others' praise, but from the inside, as the Lord has already assured us of his praise. But second, there's not only the motivation here, but what we see the ant not only is motivated without having a chief or officer or ruler kind of, you know, whipping them, but the, you see here in verses uh, uh, 8 and 9, or verse 8, pardon me, there is persevering, diligent work. The ant works hard. Verse 8 says, she prepares her bread in summer. Under the hot sun, she scurries about getting the job done. Hard to imagine now, but imagine you're out down in the Boston Common having a picnic and the hot sun is beating down on you. Maybe you're having a picnic and there are little ants trying to get some morsels of your food to bring it back to the colony. I don't know if ants sweat, but they don't care. They just work. They don't complain. They don't wait. They delight to work even in the heat of the summer. And so friends, we should not be surprised that work is sometimes hard that we sweat, and sometimes it feels like we're working in the heat of the day. 
can be frustrating. That's part of the curse from Genesis 3, the, the thorns in the ground. But the Lord calls us to look to the ant's perseverance. Think about a man who is discontent with his work. Think about someone who maybe is, is tempted to be lazy and not diligent. It's hypothetically, this person, he feels like he could have a more rewarding or challenging job. So he's just lazy. He doesn't like his work. He complains about his supervisor. My supervisor won't develop me. He doesn't care about me. Now, the organization is too political. I'm not going to be able to advance in it. But at the same time, you say, well, why don't you look for another job? He says, oh, no, it's too risky to try to find a different job. So he's just complaining and cashing his checks. Complaining and cashing his paychecks. Because the Lord is calling us to much greater glory than that. The Lord has made us to work for his glory. In, in, in all the areas of our life, not just in our, 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 the work, the jobs that we do, but even leaning into our relationships, into the church and other areas, to work diligently. And look at the second half of verse 8. This diligent work is preparation for the future. Verse 8 says, She prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest. The ant isn't just hoping things will work out. She is planning. She is intentional. She's setting goals and is organized. The truth of the matter is, is that there is a winter blast coming our way someday. Let this morning, the cold of this morning, be a reminder to that. We almost never know how exactly or when. We don't need to go looking for it, but, but the trial of a winter difficulty, discontentment, disease, struggle, challenge, the loss of a job, relational strain, different things. There's always a trial around the corner. It's always possible. And the question is, are you preparing for that well in your life? Yes, of course, financially preparing for that. But what about spiritually and relationally as well? Are you stocking up on God's word in your life? Are you exploiting today as an opportunity from God to become more wisely prepared for tomorrow? I wonder, one year from today, are you going to be a more fruitful and faithful man or woman of God? And, and if that's true, if you hope to do that, how do you expect that growth to happen? Do you have a plan for that, friends? So I wonder, church, where, where is God calling you out of sloth and into activity. Again, I don't want to tempt you and lead you into an overwork situation, <laughs> into an idolatry of work. But at the same time, God's word speaks so much about sloth, about being a sluggard, that there must be some truth in it for us. And certainly I've found this in my own life. Where is the Lord calling you to be more intentional, to pursue him Maybe it's in your job. Maybe it's in your finances. Maybe it's in relationships around you. Maybe it's in your work or your studies. Maybe your physical health. Maybe it's your soul. Intentional scripture reading, your prayer life. Maybe it's saying, okay, this is the year I'm going to lean into community. Stop trying to deal with everything myself, but I'm actually going to confess some sin. I'm going to open up about my struggles. I'm going to, maybe this year, I'm going to try to reach out to someone else and disciple them to help someone else follow Jesus more informally. This is the year I'm going to tell my coworkers about my faith and be more open to sharing the gospel. Friends, we've seen all of these efforts from Colossians 3 motivated by God's glory. Our motivation flows from the gospel. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And the salvation, of course, is free for all who believe. And that we can approach all these different areas of our life not out of insecurity, not out of wanting other people to approve of us, not trying to, to strive for immortality in some ways or protection from harm in all different possible ways. But ultimately, we can work hard out of trust and worship to the Lord, trusting that He is the one working through us. I think about this in a corporate level too, like our church. 
You know, a healthy church like us, a healthy church should look like an anthill. We should look kind of like, a, like an anthill, just, just everybody actively working diligently together. We should be busy in some ways. Not busy for the sake of busyness, right? But we should be actively looking for opportunities to love and build one another up. We should be actively pursuing one another, following through members on the covenant we've made with each other, inviting more and more people into this community, sharing the gospel with more and more people, serving others in need in the name of Christ. Intentional, pressing forward, as the Apostle Paul says in our mission. The sluggard Christian procrastinates. He treats every precious moment of God-given life as just no big deal. But the diligent Christian is astounded that the grace of God is giving him one more moment to live for Jesus. Friends, are you in awe that the Lord has placed the, the treasure of his gospel in a jar of clay like yourself? That, that we have the privilege not only to believe in Jesus, but, but maybe if we are faithful, that we would not just be granted to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. The Bible says that is a blessing. That we have the privilege of being called his royal ambassadors, heralding, proclaiming the good news of God, the God of the universe, the good news of salvation, eternal life. We have this incredible gospel to steward, to share with our unsaved neighbors and friends and brothers and sisters. That we have great abilities and gifts we've been given to work, to serve others and the good of our city to the glory of God. Are you in awe by that? Are you motivated by that, friends? You know, one way recently that I've been inspired personally is by reading Christian biographies. Particularly, I've been reading uh, just some short biographies of, of famous missionaries throughout church history. And I've read recently about uh, Adoniram Judson, the great missionary to Burma. Uh, Corey Ten Boom, who was just a faithful witness for Christ during World War II, just protecting, harboring Jews. And then while she was locked up, suffering in a concentration camp, leading worship services and Bible studies and hymn sings there. And most recently, I've been reading about uh, uh, Amy Carmichael, Elizabeth Elliot's biography of Amy Carmichael. She was from Ireland, moved there on her own, gave her life to evangelism and mission. She, she first went to Japan and spent a few years there, and then, and then finally spent the rest of her life, 55 years in India. But you know, even these missionaries, in reading about them, they, fin they faced discouragement and even temptation towards sloth. On the mission field, there was a temptation to be a sluggard, even as a missionary in a far-off land from where she was from. Amy Carmichael, she arrived in India in the late 1800s, uh, but she was surprised when she got there that many of the other Western missionaries who'd been there a long time, that they seemed to be distracted by their own comforts and culture and less focused actually on the reason why they would be there. They were focused on getting away from the heat and having a comfortable living space and all of these things instead of sharing the gospel with people who were in need. In fact, they were often cynical and discouraged because there wasn't a lot of people responding. There was so much syncretism and, and mixing between Hinduism and Christianity. It was a very confusing time. So Amy Carmichael, she was discouraged by this, but, but listen to what she says. She writes back to her supporters in Ireland. She says, Oh, to be delivered from half-hearted missionaries. She says, Don't come if you mean to turn aside for anything. She was a firecracker, right? Don't come if you mean to turn aside for anything. For the claims of society in the treaty ports and stations. Don't come if you haven't made up your mind to live for one thing, the winning of souls. And she, the best that she could, not perfectly, but she did live this out. Despite suffering near constant sickness and persecution, Amy Carmichael poured her energies into the nation of India for 55 years. She ultimately opened an orphanage and a mission that rescued temple prostitutes and shared the gospel with thousands of people. Thousands of people through her ministry. 
But friends, this is a word for me, even as a, a gospel minister, it's a word for all of us, even foreign missionaries who've given their whole lives to the Lord can fall in to sloth. Proverbs 6 is for each one of us this morning. Whatever work that we're doing, whatever gospel work we're doing, whether abroad, whether full-time, or, or whether not vocationally. Here's a final word, a comment from a pastor on this passage. He says, your danger, your danger and mine, is not so much that we become criminals, but rather that we become respectable, decent, commonplace, mediocre Christians. The 20th century, he says, temptations that really sap our spiritual power are the television, banana cream pie, the easy chair, and the credit card. The Christian wins or loses in those seemingly innocent little moments of decision. And friends, hear me, I know, there is a time for rest. There's a time for Sabbath. We need to make sure we're not working and striving for our identity alone, for our own selfish ambition. I get all that. But there also is a time for work, for faithfulness, for diligence, especially in the things of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, God has given you not only Christ, but he has given you Christ's mission. He has kept you here for a reason. You're not teleported up to heaven yet. You are here to glorify Christ. And you're empowered by the Spirit of Christ to glorify Christ. We have incredible work to do. We have the power of Jesus in us in all these areas of our lives to work diligently for his glory. So the question I want to leave for us today, because God has created us to work diligently for his glory, is in what areas of your life is he speaking to you about now? How will you use the time he has given you diligently for his glory? Let's pray. Oh, Father, make us faithful. May we heed the warning to the sluggard. Would you help us not simply in this message, this passage, to beat ourselves up, to fall further and further and it's kind of spinning into just a depression and thinking selfishly too much of ourselves, too low of ourselves. But Lord, help us to see that you have empowered us by your spirit to work that we have the same power that raised Christ from the dead living in us, all who believe. And that power enables us, empowers us to work diligently for you. But would you give us wisdom and discernment? Not to overwork, but to work faithfully. Not to work motivated by selfish ambition or insecurity, but out of worship and thankfulness to you. And would you use us, Lord, would you use us to bring good to those around us and to bring the gospel to those around us, both unbelievers who need it to be saved and Lord, believers who need to be spurred on that we might continue in our salvation. Help us, we pray. In Christ's name, amen.